Greetings, everybody. This is Jeff Scott, and this is my weekend review for uh, the 17th of 2019. I'm in Vietnam, where it's Sunday, 2 p.m. It's only 2 a.m. in your place, but it is Sunday. Um, I told you I was going to do these, but, you know, I'm sort of addicted to doing them. It's not that I like to hear me, myself talk, as my wife probably thinks is the case, but it's rather I learn by doing these, and it helps prepare me for the week. So I, I put the title today, New Highs Ahead, with a question mark. We broke through some overhead support on the small caps of the NASDAQ, excuse me, on the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, but we haven't yet on small and mid caps. And the transports have been not so great either. So the question is, are those predicting that we've topped and we're falling down or will we reach new highs? I think that question exists. Right now I'm positioned to go higher, but I can switch on a dime and so can you. Uh, this is for education purposes only. Anything I recommend, spirit of education, not investment advice, I'm a doctor, not a broker. I'm independent. I pay for all the tools that I have, and trading balls risk. Union loan are solely responsible. Now, last week I showed you some pictures from the first week of my vacation, so I thought I'd show you a little bit more. This was a, a street scene in Hanoi. Um, yeah, look at the stores, Paget, Omega, um, everything you could imagine, Louis Vuitton, Gucci. So to me, they've got a vibrant market economy and a politically communist nation. I know there's a lot of freedoms and freedom of speech that they don't have, and there's certainly um, some con concern about um, if they say things publicly. But walking around, we actually, we just love it. We've had a great time, my wife and I. Um, on Sunday in Hanoi, they closed some of the main streets near um, this large lake, and it looks like a carnival. There's kids riding around these electrical vehicles. Well, actually, they think they're riding around. They're remote control. What a great idea. Um, there, there are tile games, there's block games. It's, again, it's like a carnival, so much fun. Um, as we traveled down to the south, we went to Wei. And Wei is famous for some of the worst battles of the Tet Offensive. And this is the outside of the Citadel, a walled part of the city, which was a site of some major battles versus during the Vietnamese War. Um, I'm a war buff, so we went and saw the rock it was called the Rock, 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 pile. rock pile, which is the top of a mountain. Camp Carroll, which there's really not much left. And then we went to Quezon, and these were three very famous outposts in the northern part near the demilitarized zone. And um, you can see behind us a couple of helicopters. They have a very, um, I'll use the word biased museum um, with some great pictures and artifacts from the war. Uh, it was really great to be there. Um, from there, we went to the 17th parallel, which divides the south and the north, and we walked across the bridge, and the bridge has a white line in the middle, which demarcates the 17th parallel. So this was kind of like the war. My wife was on the North Vietnamese side, and I was on the south, um, but we crossed over and walked off the bridge on the North Vietnamese side. Um, then we found True Paradise. We flew down to a place called... Um, we actually drove down to Hoi An, stopped in Da Nang on the way. And this is a picture I took checking in at the Four Seasons Resort. They have a series of pools leading down. You're, you're high up and you lead down to the beach and the ocean. Um, the restaurants and the rooms are on the right and the left, and it goes out pretty far uh, the width. Probably the nicest hotel room I've ever stayed in. And I'm spoiled. Um, that was a nice hotel room. Um, Walking the streets of Hoi An, again, a carnival-like atmosphere, street vendors, and so many people, and so much fun. And this is a picture my wife will not be happy that I'm showing to people. Um, we're now in Saigon, also known as Ho Chi Minh City. Today we had our first tour, and this is um, my lovely wife standing in front of the Unification Palace in Hanoi. Excuse me, this is not Hanoi, this is Saigon. Ooh. The reunification, let me fix this. My wife just told me what I did wrong kind of like being at home, um, the Reunification Palace in Saigon, which is home, was the former home of the South Vietnamese leadership, think South Vietnamese White House, and we had a great tour of that. Um, we could understand how we got in to see the home of the Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge until we realized that the, we, went out, we were using an um, a Asian um, and U.S. travel uh, agency into China. What's it called, honey? Trails of Indochina, so if you're going to Southeast Asia, look them up. 
that apparently the owner owns the former home of Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge. So we actually got to go in and get a tour of the house. Uh, you can tell I like taking pictures of my lovely wife. So enough of Vietnam and fun. Let's get back to the markets. Um, as always, I start with this mostly to pay homage to the folks whose stuff I use. Um, I started as a CanSlim guy. I still use Investors.com and MarketSmith, but mostly as a vehicle for getting lists of stocks. Uh, Morales and Catcher with their pocket pivots, viable gap ups, et cetera, I think supercharged um, CanSlim. And then, you know, even before we heard of who Gil and, and Chris were, um, Ian Woodward and his work with George Roberts and creating HGSI, a software tool that can trade any type of investing, but really helped us take CanSlim to the computer. Down here is my buddy, George Lee, a little bit shorter term trader and quicker than I am, but we end up trading the same stocks and both doing very well with them. Van Tharp, the king of position size and money management, the R factor, Superior Profit, uh, Sagar, who I'm going to have dinner with when I'm in Thailand, and I'm going to try and convince him to um, create an add-on for HDSI, and I'll mention that in a few minutes. And speaking of trying to convince, I'm also talking to John Person and others. My goal is to get everybody's stuff that I actually use into HGSI, and the way to do that with some of the proprietary tools like Cigars and John's is to create a paid add-on, and I'll talk more about that as we go. I've alluded to it the last couple of uh, videos. Uh, John's an author, a teacher, a mentor, a good friend of mine. He also taught me how to play golf, which I did. Um, I should have put pictures there. I had some great pictures from the golf course with the lady um, caddies. Um, but John and I have become fast friends, but I met him by, I met him intellectually years ago by sitting in a couple of his talks, buying his indicators, and reading his books. So I like to think of my trading as being what works for me, and it's my personal style. Um, but I make money trading, and that's kind of why you do it. And by the way, um, in two weeks, I'll probably do my victory lap on TNDM Tandem, which I gave to you on April 9th, I believe, at $6 a share. And I looked yesterday, it's up 985% or some, thereabouts since I gave it to people, trading at $73, $74. And every time I want to go on a fancy vacation, all I got to do is sell some shares of Tandem um, and pay for it. I still got plenty left. Hope you bought some too. Um, I have a lot of tools on a desert aisle. I need Trade Station, Thinkorswim. I need HGSI and Edge Raider. And I'll show you some of the other tools below that that I use that make my life easier. Um, I am independent. Um, in fact, when I show you an add-on that I've been working on in HGSI, um, I'm actually um, paying for that personally. It's not something that will be shared, but I built it as a model so I could demo it to some of the folks that I'm trying to um, come on board. Um, free 30-day trial to the program, and under investing strategy, you can get some videos. So last week, I said we're probably, we felt like we were in this red circle. I wasn't convinced we were falling over. I talked about how we kept shooting back up over the last couple of years, every time it looked like we were rolling over. And what did we do? We went right back up. So we get into this uncertainty, and it really becomes like a Darvis box in this area. And rather than breaking through to the downside, we broke through to the upside. So when that happened, I immediately covered any short positions, contra ETFs, and uh, volatility, long positions, and I went longer in the market, buying stocks, calls, sold some puts way out of the money, um, and did some bull put spreads. You know, those who've been with me for a long time know that when I'm bullish on the market, I hate to do covered calls because I limit my upside. But I also recognize that I also limit my downside because it, it reduces some of the cost of going in. So because I do think there's limited upside here, although I do think there's more upside, I started looking where it makes sense financially to do covered calls instead of out and out long positions. Why? What looks right to me? It really looks at how much premium is. Um, there's a thing called skew, and skew looks at volatility. And in a smile, the volatility is actually higher as you go further away from the current price. And so I look for, when I have an instrument that has a smile on the skew and the out-of-the-money options seem to be more expensive than the at-the-money from a time value perspective and from a volatility perspective, 
I look at cover calls and I saw some that I liked um, this week. Now, can't see it well here, maybe you can see it better on the video because it's pretty bright in my room. But the only parts that the market that really looked red here, real estate interestingly looked weak on Friday. That wasn't the story that I'm gonna talk about as we go. I think real estate looks strong right now. Um, and I'll talk about why. Industrials had some weakness as well, but we had a pretty good week. Um, you know, we've had, you know, the market seems to sell off late in the day often, um, but we had a pretty good week. And you can see the Dow futures ended up 156, the NASDAQ futures up 78. Major markets tell the story. Let's go look at them very quickly. Oh, by the way, I, I, it's covered up here, but not intentionally. I'm at my high of my year. I was up 50% right away. Um, then I gave back a, a little bit, but I'm now up 57, 58%. If I put this and my other trading account together, I'm up in the 60s. Um, I think that's a good year so far, and I'm very tempted to... Um, to go small the rest of the year and keep my number up. But every once in a while, you get these big, crazy return years. And the last thing I want to do is miss out on a lot of upside. I think it's worth it this week, and I have a little bit more time than I did last week, to actually go in and look at um, some of these things closer. Here's my thinkorswim. These are E-minis. I have, on every chart you'll see, in red is the 200-day moving average. In green is the 17-day. And in yellow is either the, is the 50 day or 50 period. And the only time it won't be yellow is on a white chart, it'll be blue. So you could see the E-minis broke above the 17 day on Tuesday, closed up with a big bar on Monday. And we'll talk about the Eureka that formed on Monday. That's not a very common um, finding. Um, and a PPS buy signal from John Person came in on Tuesday as well. Um, even on Friday, it had pocket pivot volume on both on the five day. It's um, still in a squeeze and the bongo daily is green and it closed in the upper uh, quarter or so of its range. Strong day for the E-minis, even with the little give back at the end. Um, if you look at the NASDAQ futures closing near the high, again, pocket pivots up 1% on the day, closing near the top of the range. Um, PPS buy came in on Monday when it took out its 200 and its 17. Notice the angle of ascent now is turned up on the 50-day moving average. So you've got a golden cross coming in the next couple of weeks on the NASDAQ futures. On the Dow futures, um, it is also above the 200-day moving average. And you can see that golden cross is coming very soon. Had a MOBO breakout on Friday from a squeeze, and it had a PPS buy signal earlier in the week. Not so pretty compared to the others is the Russell 2000, which I'm using. I could go, see if I can get this, WRTY. All right, looks exactly the same, but at least I'm talking futures and futures. And let me check down here, six months, one year daily. All right, so this is the worrisome chart. And it's worrisome because we ran up and we failed at the 200-day moving average. Little full back, we tried again and we failed. So we've failed twice at the 200-day moving average. You know, the saying what once was support becomes resistance. Um, we're now trailing behind the 17. We're below the 200. The 50 has turned up. So I'm a little nervous on the, um, the Russell. And I hope that that's just a laggard and not predicting that the market's going to roll over. The VIX, speaking of market rollover, there was some volatility in the market Wednesday that quickly cooled off, but it's continued to come down. I think there was a lot of news about China on Wednesday. VIX is at a point where it used to be before the October, November rise. So we've gotten back down to a comfortable level on the VIX. And then if I look at um, the dollar, you know, the dollar is sort of going sideways in my mind. Um, I'm not good at drawing things on this program, but if I was good, I might even look at a box. Yeah, it's not gonna do what I want, but we're kind of in a box here. Um, so we're, we're in a trading range on the dollar right now. 
I guess is my best way of putting it. Um, dollar strength, probably bad for the market. Uh, dollar weakness, probably good for the market. Um, I'm just going to switch to the weekly charts. I'm not necessarily going to go through them and just take a look at what we see. But you should see some pretty good strength um, over the last, you know, since the middle of December. Big reversal here on the E-minis. Tested on the 50 weekly. It looks strong. Same with the NASDAQ. Same with the YM. The one big difference here is the Russell with the weekly sell signal as well. VIX is low and the dollar, as I said, is sort of going sideways. All right. Now, last week I didn't have my Genesis charts up, but I really like these. Think of columns, E-minis, NASDAQ, Russell, NYSE, and Dow. Think of daily, weekly, and monthly. You can see all of them have had a turnaround on the daily and are moving up towards, if not at new highs, but new highs going back um, for the year, not forever. Because if you look on the weekly, you could see we still got a ways to go on everybody. So the dailies look strong everywhere. Um, even the Russell futures look okay here, um, but they're the clear laggards. On the E-minis and everything else on the weeklies, you see the reversal, um, the Russell, um, the weakest. And then on the monthlies, you could tell that what had been a very easy market to trade and make money has had some rough time going since October. I like this because in one screen, it gives me a sense of what the market's doing across the various um, major indexes. So let's look at what's underlying. Rates sort of stabilized. Now, reality is they dropped a little bit on the 10-year. There's a little nubbin going up on the 30-year. That's actually a good thing. You're going to widen the, the spread between the 10s and the 30s. Um, now, if rates are falling, that should be good for REITs, MLPs, utilities, and dividend payers, and maybe even home builders. Um, and that's exactly what I saw, although a little bit lighter on the home builders. Didn't see a lot of strength in the banks, but you know what? They look like they could be close. So the rates are, are in an area which I think are conducive to market strength. Now, years ago, I put these lines on the chart as the top line was a line and a single line on the 30. When we get above that, I think the market's in trouble, and we saw that. Um, when we get below this lower line on the 10-year, I worry about the economy killing us. And we're in a pretty sweet spot right now. Again, hard to see, but this is the spread between um, the twos. Excuse me, this is a two and uh, should be a 10 and 30 year spread. And you could see in blue here that it's not quite inverted yet. And the, the descent has definitely slowed down over the last couple of weeks. AD lines have supporting a higher market, both turned up on the small stocks and the big stocks. You could see it better here that the NYSE. Um, AD line clearly turned up. It's below its prior highs, as did the uh, ETFs representing the diamonds, the Qs, the spiders, and the IWM. With weakening rates, even the bonds turned up this week as below. Breath improved the number of stocks above the 200, still below this long-term line that seems to be a line in the sand of when um, the market gets a little weak. Um, <clears throat> so it's still higher, but still um, safe on the 200 stocks above the 40, um, really fell hard in one week, comment upon that last week, and had a nice rebound this week, but certainly not overbought. <clears throat> also having a big rebound this week from the yellow arrow on the right up to the green arrow are my three-month new high, new lows, which I like to track this because I, I almost guarantee every time it hits the top or the bottom, you see a reversal. The Daily McClellan, I'm probably over-reading these. Maybe there's a little divergence between um, the summation index and the, the S&P, but probably too early. I don't think there's a signal there. My buckets improved this week. We're close to 50-50, which would mean neither bullish or bearish. And we don't have a lot of stocks below the Bollinger Bands or above. So I pass because there's no signal here. There's not been a Hindi omen since the market turned down although we had plenty in September and October, which told us a downturn was coming. Um, 
the market tone over the last 10 days or so has gone considerably bearish. But notice we had a series of kahunas come into the market on uh, Monday, which reversed the pullback that we were in the midst of. <coughs> and from a sector strength perspective, as you'll see going forward, um, the only things that are green here are um, utilities and technology. And what's red is the industrial. So on the edge rater, clearly strength has narrowed some. Now I have a lot of tools I look at from a top-down perspective. This is my Q edge. <clears throat> in brown, I see five-day performance. In magenta, one-day performance. And I could see on the last week, energy-led information technology and healthcare. But frankly, except for consumer discretionary, over the last five days, everything was up. When I go down and I look at the sector strength, um, the thing that's leading is energy. Um, financials have picked up as well. And the pace is over the last five days, healthcare has been moving as well. Healthcare, energy, financials, and information technology. Utilities on this very quick acting uh, measurement had been leading the market, and then they softened this week quite a bit. I was interested in energy, so then I clicked on that little check, and I brought up the different industry groups in energy and looked at the five-day pace, and I saw this oil, equipment, and services was up there, but then down here, oil, the oil and gas drilling had even a higher Q score. <coughs> and I looked at this, and I saw how weak it was. Then for about three months, it's gotten medium, and now it's breaking out over the last two weeks as one of the strongest groups. And then I jumped down there and look, looked at which were the best priced of the entity, and um, neighbors, unit, HP, all looked interesting. And unit is probably one that I'm going to focus on a little bit on my own review. I also, in Thinkorswim, this came from the market scholars, have some um, indicators that I can look at the various sectors, and it showed me that industrials was the weakest. Um, in the past, I've had a number of indexes that I like to follow. One is the Canaries, the list of stocks is here. And I don't want to say the Canaries are dead, but the Canaries are going nowhere. Now, Apple is performing well. Amazon looks like it's waking up. Netflix has been lagging them, but has been positive. Um, Google looks well. Baidu's tough. I think Facebook might be rolling over. So you've had a mixture of these, and where do you get? You get a flat line in between support and resistance. I'm not sure how many people paid attention, but two weeks ago I came up with a new version of the Scott E-Index. And what I do is I take some of the leaders in the market and I plot a index, and when this index rolls over, I know it's time to get out of the market. What I said last week was clear-cut danger as we pulled down to the 17, um, but we had it basically rolled over yet. There was, as you could see here, a phoenix occurred in the market, um, which would have been concerning. And But lo and behold, what happened as the week went on, we had a reversal, a nice week, and we're out to new highs. The stocks in this index are listed here. Not all of them are great today, but as a whole, that includes Boeing, we're out to new highs. Know your news and earnings. I think the most important thing to point out is that we have a Fed announcement and um, forecast and chair press conference on Wednesday, and I think that will make or break the entire week. Here's some of the earnings. Um, it feels like we're getting nearer the end of the earnings season, or maybe it's the beginning of the next earnings season because I see Micron here. Um, you know, it's a judgment call to hold the stock over earnings. It's bad judgment to not know when your earnings date is scheduled. Market thoughts are reverse the upside this week with a rare eureka moment. Small mid caps lag while the NASDAQ 100 stocks led the charge. Fed meets this week, and anything that changes to the bearish side, i.e. interest rate increases or pace of quantitative tightening, could spook this market. Question remains whether taking out the 200-day SMA will lead to, to a grind to new highs, or does weakness in small mid-caps predict that we're topping? 
Once again, I'll predict less and prepare to play the market that we get. Despite the negative news from the China talks, this market resilience makes me want to keep my long stance. That said, I remain ready to pounce to the short side if the market signals that that's the right way to go. Now let's take a look at the charts. If you're watching this on YouTube, by the way, um, please consider um, liking this, subscribing to it, sharing the video with your friends. Um, I don't charge for this. Um, my wife would say I do it to stroke my ego. ego. There's probably some truth to that. I do it because it makes me a tr better trader. There's a lot of truth to that. But without you know, people commenting to me on what they like and don't like and without seeing people subscri uh, subscribe and hit the like bar, sometimes I feel like I'm preaching to nobody, in which case I probably don't need to do it anymore. So not a threat by any means, just a request to like it, share it, and um, please subscribe on YouTube. I don't get anything from that, but it allows me to track the numbers a little bit. So I like to go into market force and divergence. I do this every day, but let's look at it right here. Let's look at the E-minis. We'll start with by looking at them. There's five or six points. Number one, is it in a buy or is it in a sell? It is in a buy. Um, it's weird. On this, we've never triggered a buy. I don't understand that on the weekly. Is it a buy daily? It should be a buy on the weekly. I don't see it. Is it a buy monthly? I'm going to consider there a buy there because it's on my other platforms. The market is strong. We're in the middle of the auto envelope. That's the third thing I look at. We got a green bar. That's the second thing. A green bar is tells me it's okay to be long or hold. A blue bar says I'm neutral. I could be long or short. And a red bar says I should not be buying new long positions. So green arrow up, green bar on the daily, on the weekly, and the monthly. That's super strong. I'm not overbought here. Um, I look for signs of MACD divergence. Why? Because it takes a while when they're red, but eventually the market rolls over. And when they're green, eventually the market goes up. I don't see any of those on the E-minis. I come down here, the high jump, I'm at 91%. I'm getting extended. So that tells me we're the most extended off of its major moving averages. 91% um, of the highest there in the last um, year. So that's high enough that I want to be concerned, but this has been a relatively orderly move there. I'm probably not going to take that as a reason to get out. And both my daily and weekly bongo are green, which is good. So I'd say that E-minis look quite well right here. The NASDAQ futures, same old, same old. Not sure why my weekly one's not painting. I may have to talk to John. It's probably something that I'm doing wrong in this chart. But anyways, um, the difference here is that we've got some of these MACD divergence dots coming. But as I've said before, it can take weeks before it rolls over. I'm still happy with the NASDAQ being long. The Dow futures, um, again, I don't know what happened to the buy signal over here. That is certainly strange. Um, I would have expected one over here. But I am long buy signal in green. 85% bongos are green. I feel pretty good about the Dow. And then the weak sister, the Russell and the mid caps, you know, it's got green and up, so I shouldn't be unhappy about it. Um, it's at 72%. It's daily bongo is, is red. And if I look at the mid caps, it's got a weekly sell signal. So there was a buy signal. I have a feeling that the buy signal is there on all of them. I'm just not picking it up because the way that it's being painted on the chart is below the lowest bar on the chart. Bottom line is I see bullish reasoning here. If I look at the dollar, it looks different, doesn't it? It's got a sell signal and a red bar on the short term. Long term, it's still strong. Um, and we have 33% on the high jump. This tells me that it's okay definitely to be long this market, at least for another day. Um, in HGSI, let me size it because I changed some things around here. Now, if you're paying attention, you heard my comment about um, add-ons. So I will show you some things that I've been working on in a few minutes. But let's start with the Major Markets Plus. So the Major Markets Plus is something that was put together by, by Ian and Ron, maintained by Ron. And what I do is I use the first one because it gives me all the major indexes and some major other ETFs to look at. I, 
I rank it by the top down, which heavily weights Friday's performance. I get a sense of where the money's flowing. NASDAQ, Biotech, Dow Industrials, NYSC, NASDAQ 100, S&P. The big guys in the, in the NASDAQ up top, the S&P 500, sort of in the middle. And then go down here, the Russell, the small caps, and the transports are lagging. Um, you know, Dow signal would need the transports to confirm if we get a new high. All right, let's go to the S&P 500. I have to remodel. If I, I use a different resolution on my, when I do my work, I use 4K. But when I do my videos, I got to make it a lot smaller. So this is my attempt at doing that. So this, make this um, new stuff here to talk about. Really excited um, that George is doing this. And I'm hoping I can get Sager and some of my other buddies who are um, in the business to move some of their proprietary things into HGSI, but they're only going to do it for a fee. So, you know, to me, it's worth it. So, first thing is, um, <clears throat> I had talked several weeks about how this was slowing down. It looked like it was going to roll over, and it pulled down into, this is my chandelier stop, which is a new part of HGSI to come out soon, and it came down into the chandelier and bounced, and the next day it had a JAS buy signal, which I can't really tell you much more about that, um, but I'm put it together to hopefully convince one of my friends to move his signals here and to show you what you can do with it. You notice down here it had a kahuna, a eureka, and my indicator fired here all on the same day. Um, this is a very bullish reversal, um, and this was Monday. Not surprising that it was a good day in the market. On the weekly, the part that I want to point out is that if I start connecting the dots, we took out our prior weekly high. If I connect the dots on the daily, which I did in a different view, but let me do it in this view now. We took it out intraday on Wednesday and closed above it on Friday. So we've broken out above resistance on the S&P. So now three road scenario. Row number one is we just go right back down. That's the bearish signal. I don't anticipate it. Row number two is we go up to infinity and beyond. I don't anticipate that one either. Row number three is that we basically go up and down and work our way higher and grind towards new highs. That's the camp that I'm in. But I've got to be prepared for all three of those scenarios as I was taught by Ian. Now, I know some of you are going to say, Jeff, I don't see a Eureka. How did you get a Eureka? Um, there are two settings, or there's more than two. But I can go in here on the Eureka, and I've got it running on the NASDAQ. If I run it on the NYSC, it may not be there. But I like using the NASDAQ. I found that to be more reliable and capture more signals. NASDAQ, I gave you my three roads. I think it's going to go higher. I think it's going to grind higher. It's very bullish. If I look at the Dow Jones Industrial, You know, if this was a stock pullback, breaking above the 17, above its chandelier, um, big volume on Friday with options expiration. You've got my signal there. I like the Dow long as well. Now, the weekly is concerning because <clears throat> I like to compare the relative strength of anything to the S&P. And you can see that the Dow's relative strength has dropped below the median. It's falling compared to the S&P 500. If I look at the NASDAQ composite, strongest of the bunch, it's at new high territory, um, is my next target up here, 8,000, 8,100. Yeah, in my mind it is. Um, and that's where I hope we go, but there will be back, backing and filling till we get there. Again, a triple bogey here, my signal, 
a Eureka and a Kahuna occurring um, on Monday as well. Market reversal. Notice the relative strength of the NASDAQ is actually higher than the S&P 500. What this chart is in red is the relative strength of the whatever I'm looking at, in this case the NASDAQ versus the S&P 500. And then the, what's in blue is a uh, moving average that's put on that which is a 21 period moving average, and in this case, a 21 week moving average. And I find that the best buys occur when I get a break above this blue line, and typically a kahuna would be helpful here. You can notice that my indicator on the weekly turned positive here on this way up. So the NASDAQ looks super duper. Um, the Russell 2000, not as good, it's even below its PSAR dot, and it's below the relative strength over here. I've already pointed out I've got some nervousness there. The 50, let's see where it's at, innovator. This is the IBD 50. Doesn't this look like the canaries? It's gone sideways in between resistance. I would love to see the IBD 50 stocks break out to new high. That would be confirming for me if it did. Um, what else do we have here? We can look at the dollar. I talked about it being somewhat sideways here. Um, you know, in a big range, it's sort of sideways here in my book. Um, between 25.30 and 26.20, there's a 90 cent range, which is giant. I get it. But we, you know, until we break above or below that, in my mind, we're somewhat in a box. Um, and hard for me to say anything on that. Um, the volatility we talked about has come down to where it was living before. Um, it's definitely down to a level of 13, which is consistent with where it was during the big market run-ups. Gold and silver, um, highly related to the dollar. Gold is below its chandelier stop, although it did have a Jeffrey buy signal on Friday. Um, with the dollar weakness and silver. Um, I have a hard time playing gold and silver right now. You could have made a lot of money from December to, you know, to the end of February. Right now, I don't know. And I think this, this candle here um, signals some clear uncertainty in, um, in silver and gold. The last of the big commodities that I worry about is oil. Oil's been in a bull move. You can see that it broke above its chandelier stop here in early January, and it's slowly making its move higher. And you can see it even better on the weekly. You can see what happened. It just broke above the, the 21 period moving average on the relative strength versus the S&P 500. All right. Then I like to look at the industry groups, hit the warehouse view. And on these, I want to look at two-day force up. And I could see we've got 60, two-day force down. All I've got is 10, insurance, interesting, managed care, apparel, payment, midstream. Some of these actually had some good-looking stocks, which is interesting. Oil and gas services had a bad day on one day on Friday, and even rates were weak. If I go to five day down, I've got, that's not going to work. I've got 32 down on the five day, and on the five day up, I've got 59. And some of those um, that look bad on one day will actually show up on this list as well as on a longer term trending up. But let's take a look at what's moving on the two day. This is how I start every night's routine. I go through my TC2000 charts to get a sense of market breadth and direction. I look at my person signals in TradeStation or Thinkorswim because today they're not available in HGSI. Then I go into HGSI, I look at the major industry groups because I think the charting platform is outstanding. It has my indicators in it that I like. Then I look at the top industry groups, I right click on it, change to group, 
and I get Broadcom. So let's take a look at some of the top performers here. Broadcom had earnings come out, had a Bible gap up, had a Kahuna. Um, you know, it's had a big move. It's gone up from 270 to 290 um, in one day. Um, that's a big move. High was 299, it closed at 290. I think I have to let this one come back. However, if you're a fan of Morales Catcher and Bible Gap Ups, you could consider it, but since it closed in the lower half, I'd probably pass. NVIDIA, you know, yesterday's leaders often are tomorrow's laggards, but let's look at this. Is it time to be buying NVIDIA? I think so. Um, had a nice move. Let's give it a little bit more days here. See how it came down. Had a nice move on Friday. Big move here on the breakout day on Monday. Look at the weekly chart, closed near its high. Look up here, you got a Kahuna, a new Jeff Jeffrey signal, a Bongo Weekly, and we crossed above its moving average versus the S&P 500. NVIDIA looks to me like it's going up. Um, and it's you're buying it at a discount to where it was just six months ago. But keep in mind what I said before, a lot of times yesterday's leaders are laggards going forward. And if you look at the EPS strength rate, it doesn't look that compelling. Texas Instruments, nice chart here, pull back to the 200, had a doji on the 200, a high close doji two days later, and a move up since, um, three kahunas and five trading days. Um, I like Texas Instrument. Again, the earnings per share growth is kind of tepid. Intel, um, same thing I just said about the others. Qualcomm, recent flip of its chandelier moving up nicely. Um, you could certainly argue this one as well. It pays a 5.5% dividend yield. My problem with this one is it's below its 200-day moving average. It's still in a downtrend. It hasn't converted that yet. Micron earnings this week, so that's enough to not touch it. A, a reversal off the 50 with a new buy signal. Um, a breakout above the chandelier would be interesting with the falling 200-day moving average so close and earnings, I'd probably pass on it. Cree, I wish I owned Cree. Unfortunately, I have bad connotations because I think back, um, some of these stocks have had some challenges over the last couple of years, the LED stocks. Breaking out to new highs here, um, a Kahuna. Um, not sure it's not a viable gap up. What's not a meant the volume criteria? 4.5 million average volume is fifty-eight. So it had low volume. That's interesting. That's hard. No, fifty-day average volume is one point two four nine. That was dollar volume. Um, so I guess it didn't have, well, it did have big volume. So again, I'm not sure that's not why it's not a viable gap up. Um, let me see if I didn't screw something up here. Because on the index view, dummy, dummy, it was a viable gap up. Got to like this one. That looks interesting as well. So I would, I typically go through the top 10 of these. Right click, back. Internet Media Index. We'll look at the first three or four. Snap. The stock has had its challenges since its IPO. It's clearly reversed. The chandelier is tracking right up with price. I'm not a fan. I don't like the earnings per share but something has changed in Snap. Huya, a Chinese internet firm. I bought some on the bottom. I'm still holding it, although it had a reversal here after earnings. Um, I think it still looks at a good point. Earnings are not compelling. IQ, I sold it when it dropped, and of course it went back up. This looks at an interesting buy point. It's Get above that PSAR dot, I would be interesting. I think that looks strong. A beautiful reversal in early January and a nice march up. Baidu, not so nice. It's below the chandelier. I'm just not even going to pay attention to it. 
YY, another one that I thought was interesting. It does make money the next quarter. Two quarters out, I don't pay any attention to. They revise. Um, trades plenty for me to trade. Good industry group strength. It had a pocket pivot on Friday. It had my signal when it went above the 200 occurred on Monday. Mobile breakout from a squeeze. Good demand. I like YY. And that's one that I've got, I believe, on my buy watch list for this week. Third one down is biotech. Um, boy, I can't play a lot of these as individuals because they're customers. But I can share with you things that are publicly known. Amgen will be one of the big biosimilar stocks. And I know you're looking at this and going, how the hell can I tell anything there? Um, if you do it enough, come to one of my live meetings, your charts will look like mine. Um, lots of kahunas, a pocket pivot, mobile breakout from a squeeze, my signal hit on Wednesday, um, makes money but not much earnings per share growth, pays a dividend, um, bottom of its channel here, um, looks like it wants to go higher with the rest of biotech. Biogen, I liked a little bit more, but the same story, sideways move, mobile breakout, pocket pivot, kahuna, two out of the last three days. I guess it would be nice if you, yeah, that's too far away from me. I, I like this here if it takes out its PSAR. Gilead, this has been a laggard forever. It had some upgrades over the week. Below the chandelier stop, I usually pass. Celgene is a stock that's sideways because it's being bought BMS. Regeneron, um, a great innovative lab company, partners a lot with Sanofi to sell. It's below the chandelier, I'll stop, I won't spend any time. Vertex just broke above the chandelier. Mobile breakout, pocket pivot, ton of volume. Good earnings per share growth, pretty good multiple PE. And I would go down to Morrowful from Web and look at Finviz. And see what the information was. A, pr a new approval for CF. Okay. Best biostack stock to buy now by Motley Fool. All right. Well, that's a pretty good stamp of approval. Bluebird Bio, there was a 60 Minutes last week about a gene therapy for um, sickle cell. They're the company behind it. And they're in a nice uptrend since the December lows, way off their all-time highs. And that's a reversal candle here. Immunomedics, don't know much about them. Since I have non-disclosure <clears throat> agreements with many of these, I'll buy LABU. <clears throat> if I think biotech is strong, I'll buy LABD. When I think biotech is weak, um, my guess here is biotech is, is um, strong, and I'd probably be looking at adding to my LABU position. So typically, on my weekend review, I will go through at least the top 10 groups. Then I do a collection of lists to share with you some of those lists very quickly. Mind you, I've got a foot massage in 37 minutes, so I'm going to try and cut this off very quickly. Um, all these are lists from various sources, investors.com, MarketSmith, um, other places that I get lists from. I have a number of my own searches and scans that I use and um, collect some other lists from the web. I combine them, take all the stocks in the list above $5 and 500,000 shares, unless we're in a bearish market, in which case um, I may lower my volume because I don't have that many stocks to look at. <clears throat> I'll put them in my consolidated buys list, and I will look at these, um, all of them, on the weekend. Now, the interesting thing is um, I saw a tweet from somebody who does 8,000 stocks a day using Finviz, and God bless them, I don't know how you can do that. A lot of my scans will come from TradeStation. Those of you that have TradeStation know that it's a finicky, finicky but strong program. 
and it takes forever. I started this scan update when I started this video. Um, so a lot of these scans, I'm going to bring the results from these scans into my consolidated buy list as well. Once I have that buy list, I generate a list of stocks. I look at these in TradeStation, and I come up with what I'm going to do next week. So let me make a couple comments on some of the stocks I liked and didn't like, and then give me a three-minute review of what I'm doing in my add-on, and hopefully it'll be a model for others to follow. They just heard you. Thank you, Sherry. You can see here um, biotech at a couple of plays there. So mortgage, fi mortgage finance. Remember low rates, good for housing. REITs, utilities, MLPs, and I have quite a few of them showed up here. Um, I don't have time to look at all of them. Let me look at a couple that I thought were actionable. The first two are not anything. Momo, I'd have to look and see when earnings are. Why did I like it? It broke above the 200. It had a, a kahuna on the weekly breaking above its moving average. It had a nice breakout here on Tuesday. It looks strong. And if I remember correctly, it even has earnings. Eh, not great earnings for share growth. Huge demand. Applied materials. This is an old name. Sideways to the 200-day moving average. Had a chandelier flip. Packet pivot, kahuna, mobile breakout from a squeeze, a new weekly buy as well, and a daily buy on mine um, a few days ago. Again, not much in the way of earnings per share growth. ASML is an expensive stock, but a break above resistance. <coughs> mobile breakout from a squeeze, pocket pivot and kahuna, and clearly not too far extended. Small dividend. In the oil patch, this one looked interesting to me because I'm a sucker for earnings. Look at the earnings per share growth. It pays a dividend. From a chart perspective, I'd rather wait to broke above 13, so I know it's not just going to continue going sideways, but that's Berry Petroleum. Hut Hut, Chinese um, hotel change, had a viable gap up on Friday. I'm not going to chase this, but, you know, this was not a shocker. A bunch of pocket pivots, JAS buy signal, two kahunas um, in a squeeze with a mobile breakout two days before an earnings pop. Somebody knew something. Um, it's a Chinese stock. Um, again, Bible gap up rules in, in play. I don't like buying something that closes in the lower third. Certainly going to watch it. Um, a bunch of the telecommunication stocks looked interesting. Now, why in the world would a gross stock investor buy Vodafone? That's a very good question. I asked that to myself when I decided to show it to you. 9% uh, dividend yield. It looks like it's done going down. It's broken above the 50. Um, yeah, it'll be safer if I can cross above the blue line here, but I had a new Jeffrey Weekly signal, a Kahuna, a Bongo Weekly, breaking above moving averages. I like Vodafone. And in that same group, you could include orange ADRs. Again, similar pattern, big gap up on Friday, pays a 4% dividend. Speaking of dividends, um, we've got a couple of apartment investment and management. This has been a leader, broke out again from a high base, pays a 6% dividend. Nope, most of these, or many of these I've already shown you. Um, don't know anything about Janice Henderson Group. I've been watching it the last couple of weeks. It pays a 6% dividend. A lot of the asset management companies, and maybe it's because of their dividend, um, looked interesting this week. Funko was another one that looked interesting. It's probably their Chinese stock. It's got great earnings per share growth, greater than its PE. It's currently in an uptrend, broke above its chandelier here. Clear this PSAR dot, and I'd be interested in buying that. 
Healthcare Realty Trust, another REIT, paying 3.7%. Pullback, it looks like it wants to go. Look at the volume that came in on Friday. Outfront Media, another REIT, um, high base, breaking out here, 6.4% dividend. Look at the earnings per share growth there. So a lot of stocks look interesting, and here is the list that I had. Now, what do I do with this list? I put this list into my trade station radar screen, and I watch it. Now, a couple of things I want to show you. This will take five minutes. I do not have access to any proprietary code. However, I wanted to create an add-on that would mimic some of the things that I do in TradeStation to protect me and protect the proprietors of those products that I'm trying to imitate. I did not put the appropriate names on them, and I won't use those names. But let's say it's Tuesday. And I want to look at scan number one. Again, you don't have these because you don't have the various indicators. This is something I put together to demonstrate to get some people's interest. This is all the stocks that have a buy signal within the last day and not including ETFs. So this might be one way I might want to limit my 8,000 stocks into stocks that might be attractive. And you know, Broadcom, one of the stocks that we looked at today. If I'm interested in the downside, I might look at number two. New JAS cell within one day. Trinity Industries, American Airlines, Wabtex. I could look at three. JS buy within one day, no T ETS, but you have to be in a weekly buy. So I'm now limited to 121 stocks. If you're in a weekly buy, and that tells me that you're in an uptrend. And if you're in an uptrend and you got a daily buy, this isn't a good example, it looks like a, a takeout, it means you pull back and you reversed. So I'm sure somewhere in here might be a stock that's in an uptrend, it's pulled back and it reversed. And let's prove that it's in a weekly buy. You can see it's in a weekly buy going back several months. Again, 121 stocks. How about a daily sell when I'm already in a weekly sell? If I'm looking for stocks to short, 131. Let's look at American Airlines. Weekly sell, absolutely. And if I look at the daily, um, it failed here with the new sell signal. I'd rather, I'm not sure if I'd short this here or not, but it's certainly a weak stock. Number five, stocks with a new JS buy and a chandelier flip to buy. Now I've got it down to 14 stocks. One, two, probably half of these are on my buy watch list. So this is a very positive group. So these would be stocks who have a new buy on the daily and whose chandelier, as you can see the little red bars here, has flipped to green it's sitting up here. That's an anomaly in the program. Um, so Hoya is another one where it went from red to green. So I'm scanning for stocks, and what is the driver for that? I found one of my best scans in Thinkorswim to be a PPS buy signal and a chandelier flip. Um, so I've tried to imitate that, and there's high overlap between these stocks. Remember, there's price and volume filters on mine, not on these, so you'll have more here but the same type of stocks. So I've put together a number of new filters on things that are imitations, but not the real thing. And I'm showing these to various developers trying to get them to come in. The goal would be that we are creating a platform, or George, it's not we, George is creating a platform in HGSI, and that that platform can now take outside parties um, who can do a proprietary add-on or will be able to do a proprietary add-on. And that add-on, they'll be able to control licensing so they're protected. And you and I will get to pay an extra fee for the rights to do that. Well, everything that I do in TradeStation, I paid an extra fee. In Metastock, I pay an extra fee. 
And I think it's a way to expand between beyond what HGSI can do today. So more to follow on that. Um, that's why I have the things in there that you don't have. And um, you know, nothing's been uh, finalized on the business side. Um, I haven't really gone out to push it. And it's just something that George and I have had a lot of discussions about. And we wanted to start by creating my own add-on and then seeing what we can do with that. So on that note, I'm going to say goodbye, everybody. And I'll talk to you next week or in two.